Happy Sabbath, everyone. Our first song this evening will be hymn 332, The Cleansing Wave. Six three, one six three at the cross. Oh 
Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to our Fall Colloquium Weekend. Um, we're delighted this weekend that we can focus on the theme of creation, and um, we're delighted that starting tomorrow morning, Dr. Sean Pittman will be with us at 9 o'clock at 10 o'clock and at 11 o'clock, basically 9 o'clock, then 10, 15, and 11.30. 9 o'clock, the science of miracles, uh, 10, 15, beautiful but wrong, and then 11.30, uh, overview of fossils and geology. And then in the afternoon, after a fellowship luncheon, we will be having a question and answer period. So please start to... Uh, formulate questions, and he says that his favorite time is the question and answer, where he can engage with whatever questions you may have. Um, also, for those of you colloquium um, attending folks, it would be well for you to take notes, so it would help you write your reflection 
um, reflections on each of the, the messages that are given beginning tonight and then tomorrow morning. We have a couple special numbers. One's going to be brought to us uh, tonight by Adam Sabankin. He is a student, natural science student here at Weimar University and um, a much sought after uh, pianist for the choir and the dorm. And he's going to play for us, um, How Great Thou Art.
Let's kneel together for prayer this evening. Father in heaven, how great thou art. And this weekend as we study the first book, the book of creation, um, we ask that we would see more of your glory and that we would understand how pivotal the fact that you are creator really is. You have many things to be thankful for, many prayers that have been answered this week. One of the prayers you've answered is to bring uh, Darren Greenfield back home and set up things for him to be taken care of. We ask that you would still draw near to him. There are other prayer requests that we have that we offer up silently at this point before you. So now, Lord, we again ask your presence to be with us here uh, this weekend, that you would speak to us and then through us uh, concerning your power as creator. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, since this is a uh, more content-driven uh, weekend, I thought what I would do is actually uh, put some slides up for us this weekend. Now tonight what I want to talk to you about is threshold concepts, threshold concepts, troublesome knowledge is what they call it in the educational literature, for those of you who are education majors, this is a big course of study going back to the early 2000s, and uh, we have several objectives for tonight's talk, and if you are summarizing, taking notes, this might help you. First of all, what is a threshold concept? Secondly, what are some examples of threshold concepts? Third, name a school whose purpose changed and explain how that change came about it was related to threshold concepts, hint. Number three, what is the purpose of Adventist education? Uh, or rather, number four. Number five, what is a threshold concept that Adventism staunchly defends? And uh, so that's what we're going to get started on. First of all, what is a threshold concept? Threshold concept is one in which, when grasped by the learner, can result in a completely new way of thinking. I call it a paradigm shift, a new way of thinking. Secondly, it's described as a doorway that leads to a deeper understanding of a concept and a significant shift in perception. So what is the threshold concept? What? Paradigm. Paradigm shift. Very easy way to say it. Why all the words? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to take after Dylan. So um, <laughs> something that just kind of shifts your, your way of thinking about something, right? A lot of paradigm shifting things that happen during the college years. Right? Questions like, will you marry me? How many think that's paradigm shifting? <laughs> or not, depending on what you say. <laughs> Which could cause another paradigm shift, right? <laughs> right, so paradigm shifting uh, conversations and concepts. Um, all right, that's number one. We are successfully through point one. Number two, what are some examples of of threshold concepts. I thought I might show you a clip tonight of a speech that might get your attention. 
we have a special guest tonight. <laughs> I thought we had a special guest tonight. Whoa. Should guide our public policy. Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay? Just a second. We've got to turn one of those down because it's in stereo at this point. So uh, <laughs> maybe one is enough here. Okay. All right. Dr. K, give me the okay. Okay, Dr. K. All right, let's try it. Which passages of scripture should guide our public policy? Should we go with uh, Leviticus? which uh, suggests slavery is okay. Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own defense department would survive its application. Folks haven't been reading the Bible. Sit. Okay, so what did you get out of that clip? What were, well, you're supposed to engage your minds. Colloquially and weekends are for engaging your mind. So what did you get out of that clip? I hear some very confident answers. Okay. No, it actually made pretty good sense. What was the sense that was being made? Of a mocking of the Bible. Anyone else more more specific than that? What are the implications that are being made? Bible can't be trusted for what reasons? What was reason number one? Slavery is taught by the Bible. Okay, if you believe that, and a lot of people believe that, then the Bible—that's a threshold concept. If you believe that, then when you read the Bible, what are you going to think? Got that wrong, maybe got some other things wrong. What was the second one? Stoning your child for disobedience. Okay. Um, so what was the implications there? All right. The Bible condones violence and murder, kind of is painting it as quite extreme. Does the Bible say the wages of sin is death? Is there one example for every one of the Ten Commandments of instant death because of breaking it? It is. There is. Um, and that's why Paul says the wages of sin is death. But it's painting it as what? Extreme, so probably not good to follow. What was the third example? What? Yeah, turning the other cheek, and if that was followed, what, what were the implications? Country could not defend itself, and then the summary statement was, if it's the application of the Bible, would render us defenseless. So this was essentially three different attacks on Scripture. Would you say yes or no? And these are threshold concepts. If you buy into them, then you're going to, when you think about the Bible, what are you going to think? Mm, kind of, maybe can't test, trust it. It's kind of schmealy. Mm. Right? So that was the point made. So that was an example of a threshold concept. Now I'm going to come back to that one because I'm not going to just leave that hanging in your mind. Right? I'm not going to just plant doubt, um, but we'll come back to it. Name a school whose purpose changed and explain how that change came about. Where is it that President Obama went to school? Yeah. He did not have the privilege of going to Weimar University. He went to Harvard University. 
How did Harvard University start? Harvard University was named after John Harvard, Harvard, and actually um, took all of his books for the initial university. And notice the logo of the university. Veritas Christo et Ecclesia, which means what? Truth for Christ and the church. That was the initial logo for Harvard University. Look at the rules of Harvard. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ whom is eternal life. Therefore, to lay Christ at the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. I mean, that sounds pretty good. That's actually in our bulletin as well. So we're kind of like the original Harvard. And seeing God has given wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of himself. This is a call for personal, for personal, for personal revival. revival. Right? right? Everyone shall exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day. He'll be able to give such an account of his proficiency therein. So twice a day, reading of scriptures and discussing it. Looking more closely, Saturday and Sunday were devoted to theology. Saturday was for formal study of biblical exposition and theology. The Sabbath day or Sunday for them was of rest included two lengthy sermons, each of which had to be repeated to tutors later in the day. So every Sabbath was a colloquium. We're having three messages tomorrow. They had two. During the week, Hebrew was added to the other ancient languages since the Old Testament was as authoritative as the New. And twice daily, there was a logical analysis of biblical passages, breaking it down into its major and minor premises and expounding its arguments. Because they believed what? Sanctify them by thy Thy truth, thy word is truth. Now, is there any discipline of study where that's not true? Is that true for someone taking math? Is that true for someone taking natural science? Is that true for someone taking business? Is that true for someone taking psychology? Is that true for someone taking education? Right. Is that true for someone taking nursing? Mm -hmm. So what happened? George Marsden, in his book, The Soul of the American University, um, studied Protestant universities and how they drifted from their original mission. By the mid-19th century, concern for clerical education no longer was a primary defining feature the majority were preparing for other professions. That's why I ask you, is it the basis of all the professions? They started to say, no, it's only for clerical or ministerial students. Ministerial education was shifted to divinity schools or separate theological seminaries. Don't talk about that here. Talk about that in the religion department. Talk about that in the theology department. Talk about that in a divinity school that's actually across campus. In fact, this last month there was a big debate at Harvard because they said all of our students are ignorant concerning religion and the undergraduate programs. They don't know how to deal with a world that's saturated by more religion than ever. And the number one seminal person arguing against it was a guy named Pinker, who's a rational and atheist professor, who said we should not have any religion let them go to the divinity school. I mean, I think that's kind of interesting. So it's this decoupling of theology and religion from all professions that is the foundation of what happened in change at Harvard. 
Moral philosophy replaced theology as the primary focus of defining collegiate Christian intellectual life. Theology remained a point of intellectual reference, but often in a residual capacity. What's that mean? A residue is left, some kind of like dust, a dust. The distinctly Christian aspects of intellectual enterprise were endangered or of being jettisoned, that means put on a jet and sent somewhere else, or broadened into vestigial platitudes, like, you know, it's a vestigial organ. We don't know what it's for, but it's there. Students increasingly did not want their behavior monitored and regulated by others, but only by themselves. Reference or reverence for scientific authority was the major intellectual manifestation of the new commitments. And this concept of religion led them to identify with the mainstream culture rather than do what? Offer a what? I want to just suggest that the purpose of Christian, especially Adventist Christian education, is to offer prophetic criticisms of the culture. Were you here when Jim Howard spoke about the importance of bringing prophecy into things? So uh, we'll talk about how creation, which is our subject this weekend, is actually related to a prophetic criticism and was foretold, actually, that this would be a subject of discussion at this time. What is the purpose of Adventist education? We've seen what the purpose at Harvard is. H-U, now what about W-U? Woo. Not who, woo. <laughs> so Adventist education. Um, threshold concepts in the Great Controversy. The mind in which error has once taken possession can never expand freely to truth even after investigation. Think about that for a minute. Do we need to be careful what we hear, what we look at? Because if we get the wrong idea, what happens? It's hard to change the mind. Have you ever talked to someone that says, well, look, I read this book about the Bible, but not the Bible, and it's very hard to talk to them because they, their mind has already been kind of made up by something that's simply not in the Bible? How many of you ever talked to someone like that? The old theories will claim recognition. The understanding of things that are true and elevated and sanctifying will be confused. Superstitious ideas will enter the mind to mingle with the true, and these ideas are always debasing in their influence. Cleave to the word. It is written. Cast out of the mind the dangerous, obtrusive theories which, if entertained, will hold the mind in bondage so that man shall not become a new creation in Christ. A new what? Creation. This is the doctrine of what? Creation, <laughs> creation right? <laughs> the mind must be constantly restrained and guarded. It must be given as food, that only which will strengthen the religious experience. So notice Battle Creek. Um, this was John Harvey Kellogg. This is what he put in the bulletin in 1876. You may have forgotten what he wrote. How many of you are not up on the 1876 bulletin? How many of you are not even up on the 2021 bulletin at Weimar? Okay, so maybe I'll give you a break maybe for the 1876. There is nothing in the regular course of study or in rules or in practice of discipline that is in the least denominational or sectarian the Bible lectures are before a class of only those who attend them from choice. The managers of this college have no disposition to urge upon students sectarian views or to give such views any prominence in their schoolwork. When that bulletin came out, a number of people read it, including a lady named Ellen White. Do you think she was pleased with this bulletin?
The Lord never designed our college that our college should imitate other institutions of learning. The religious element should be the controlling power. If unbelievers choose this influence, it is well. If those who are in darkness choose to come to the light, it is as God would have it. But to relax our vigilance and let the worldly element take the lead in order to secure students is contrary to the will of God. The strength of our college is in keeping the religious element in the ascendancy. So whenever you hear talk of saying, you know, that should be for just the ministerial students and not others, that should terrify you. If a worldly influence is to bear sway in our school, is not to base, but bear sway in our school, sell it to, out to worldlings and let them take entire control. And those who have invested their means in that institution will establish another school to be conducted not upon the plan of popular schools, nor according to the desires of principal and teachers, but upon the plan which God has specified. Pretty powerful words, wouldn't you say? So threshold concepts sometimes can sway entire institutions. And those that once stood for Christ and the church can lose that focus. And that's why we have colloquium weekends. We take up a threshold concept, we introduce it, we try and bring in people that have defended that and talked about that, and we open it up to everybody, not just those that are taking the class issues and origins that are in the natural science majors, but, but to everybody. And one of the threshold concepts, in fact the one, that we're talking about tonight is this one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. These are the very first words of what? And these very first words are directly attacked in almost every institution of higher learning. Sad to say, not only outside of Christianity, but also within some Christian universities. I'm sure you're aware of that, right? And here's the uh, Seventh-day Adventist statement of belief based on Genesis 1. God has revealed in Scripture the authentic historical account of his creative activity. He created the universe, in an, in, and in a recent six-day creation, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is in them, and rested on the seventh day. He established the Sabbath as a perpetual memorial of the work he performed and completed during six literal days that together with the Sabbath constituted the same unit of time that we call a week today. Where is this statement from? Well, it has its basis in Scripture, but where is the statement from? It's actually a fundamental belief of the Adventist Church. It was voted at the last General Conference. Why? Because it's a threshold concept that's been under attack even within some of the denomination schools by professors who are professing something a bit differently. And I happened to be at that general conference when they were trying to make the language a little more flimsy so they would have room to actually say something different. So it's a threshold concept that had to be battled with at the highest level of the church at the last general conference session. The first man and woman were made in the image of God as the crowning work of creation, given dominion over the world and charged with responsibility to care for it. Notice the doctrines that are at stake with creation so far are what? Sabbath, marriage, 
gender, genders, there are two genders in the Bible, male and female. Is that something that people like to discuss today? Yeah. Some, po some people think there's like 400 or 40 different genders. When the world was finished, it was very good, declaring the glory of God. And this is all based on the what? These various scriptures, which we won't read right now, but you should be very aware of and able to point to. Of course, when Elohim, that is uh, a plural, cherubim, it's more than one cherub, Elohim, um, let us, this is the triunity or so-called Godhead, got together in relationship. They built these relationships that we see. They formed them and then he filled them. On day one, there was light and dark. They're in relationship with each other. Day two, there was water and there was air. And day three, there was land and there was plants. Can you see the relationship between each of those? You can't really understand one without the other. And then, not only were they formed, they were also filled. The light was filled with the sun, the dark, with the moon and stars. So day one was filled on day four. Day two was filled on day five with fowl and with fish. And day three was filled on day six with man and beast. How many can see that God is a God of relationships? He not only forms things, but he also fills things. Tohu and bohu are the Hebrew words, not tofu, tohu. And then what happened on the Sabbath day, the seventh day, sa, abba means father, bath, the place of, the place of the respected father. Then he came to meet on that Sabbath day in relationship with Eve, who had been made on the evening of day six. And they came together in relationship on the Sabbath. Can you see what's at stake? Now let's see how that's under attack. Probably the biggest proponent of attacking, um, attacking creation, the most popular um, over the last 20 years was a guy by the name of Richard Dawkins. How many of you have ever heard of Richard Dawkins? I see a lot of you even here. So Richard Dawkins, here he describes the change, when the change came. Notice the ages that he's talking about in his own life. Oops. Is that sound on? Or did, have I thought that out? So I got that at the age of about... All right, just a little technical difficulty there, but we're coming back to it. You guys ready? Give me the thumbs up when you're ready. Person, I mean, any religious person ought to reflect, do I have the religion that I have simply because of where I was born? Or did, have I thought that out? So I got that at the age of about nine. But for some reason I then reverted to Christianity at the age of about 12 or 13, which, I, which I'm a bit ashamed of, really. I mean, I think I should. Um, and then finally came to my senses at the age of about 15 or 16. Okay. So what did he say? When he grew up, what was he? When he was nine years old, what was he? He was a Christian, and then what happened? He started to question, but then he came back and he said that was a big mistake. So when was it that he was thinking about this threshold concept? How old was he? Nine, 10, 11, early teens. And, um, you know, what's happening in your brain between the age of, you know, 15 and say 25. Um, let's go back to this clip and see if we can hear it. 
I think people for generations have been fascinated by teen behavior and what is happening in, in teens. But for so long to actually look inside the uh, biology of teen behavior has been very elusive. And we just haven't had the technology or the tools to, to try to peer into the so-called black box. But now he does. Dr. Gee of the National Institute of Mental Health gets the use of this imaging machine one night a week to look at the brain structure of normal children. Teens come in and sometimes even sleep in this large magnet so he can take a long, hard look inside their brains. Now for the first time in our human history, we can actually start exploring the living, growing activity of the human brain. Five, four, three, two, one, blast off. What he discovered in the all-important part of the brain that sits behind the forehead in an area called the frontal cortex was an unexpected growth spurt, an overproduction of cells just before puberty. And this is a process that we knew happened in the womb, maybe even the first 18 months of life. But it was only when we started following the same children by scanning their, their brains at two-year intervals that we detected a second wave of overproduction. And this second wave of production is manifest by an actual thickening in the gray matter, the thinking part, in the front parts of the brain. So in other words, in the high school age, there's a complete reorganization of the brain. This is usually at the time when parents send their kids away to school. And then they put them in the hands of teachers that they need to know whether or not they can trust those teachers. Because actually everything they ever taught the child is up for grabs. Every single thing. Because the brain is now reconfiguring itself and getting a RAM update. And that RAM update starts in the teen years and doesn't really end until about age 30, and sometimes maybe longer than that. So everything is up for grabs, and the people that are talking to you about origins, they're talking to you about what is the foundation of your belief, they have basically a clean slate. However, notice this, teaching evolution to creationist students, the ultimate challenge. And there's actually numerous articles within education journals on how to shift the mind away from believing that God is the creator and creation to evolution. And uh, they talk about this as being a threshold concept. Here are the stages they mention in most articles on this, or what happens. There's a transformative aspect that has to be focused on, a significant shift in perception. Once it's changed, it's very hard to reverse it. It's irreversible, like that quote that I read you early on, great controversy, right? It's troublesome, it threatens the typical way of thinking, and so students are troubled when they first hear it but they work with them for a reconstitutive or reconfiguration and integration of new concepts, giving a new worldview. It becomes discursive. That means part of the learner's identity. And uh, this, these are the stages of changing threshold concepts. And there's actually teaching plans for each one of them. So this, this, this one, of course, because of that quote that I read to you from Great Controversy earlier, gripped my attention. Once this happens, it's irreversible many times. These are not changes likely to be unlearned or forgotten. Meyer and Land used in their literature, which shocked me when I read it, but it shouldn't have, Adam and Eve as an example. Who was it that changed Adam and Eve's perspective? The knowledge they acquired caused them to be expelled from the Garden of Eden. 
as they passed through the threshold from innocence, the landscape before them was totally transformed. This in this article was seen as positive. And they were saying they were freed from that little bubble, the Garden of, we I mean, the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and they never went back. How many think that's uh, been working out really well for... But in the article that was saying that's exactly what you need. And look it, here are like some of the teaching plans or ideas. There's the preliminal, the liminal, the post-liminal. So in other words, you're just starting to investigate. Then you're there integrating, discarding your sense of being and your ideas to why ontological and epistemic shift occurs. And then there's irreversibility, changed discourse. And there are teaching plans for each one of these stages. Now, how many of you are thankful that you're at a university where there are teaching plans that are directly the opposite of these? <laughs> That's why we have a class called Issues and Origins. That's why we have a colloquium weekend like this weekend where we're talking about creation versus evolution. But believe me, there are not many that would have that as an objective. Now, here's the teaching plan, a deliberate strategy for you education majors and others that maybe want to see exactly how they broke this down. They have their, these are the titles of the various uh, topics that would be covered. Number one, first lecture, isn't evolution just a theory? You can only imagine what that says, right? How do we know evolution happens? Why is evolution controversial anyway? Natural selection. What is the evidence for evolution? Can you see the shift occurring here? From the liminal, preliminal to liminal, can you see that? So broaching the subject and then now beginning to deconstruct. Then non-overlapping Magisteria, this is the idea that maybe both can be true. Then, one of the coup de grace. Even the Pope isn't a hardcore creationist. So point to what the Pope says about creation. This has been what he has said, what the Popes have said for many centuries. And then, did humans evolve? And then, does the theory of evolution really matter? And then finally, intelligent design on trial. This is the teaching plan that is attacking the threshold concept of what? Creation. Pope Francis says evolution is real and God is no wizard. He couldn't have created instantly. He, he had to use evolution. Uh, it's a theistic evolution approach. And by the way, isn't he the most known Christian in the world? This would be in the lecture, right? So teaching evolution to creation students, the ultimate challenge. Unlike other threshold concepts, accepting evolutionary theory often conflicts not just with previously held belief, but also with ideas that may form the very basis of a student's notion of themselves. By the way, if you took all the passages about creation out of the Bible, would that be a problem? Because if there's no literal beginning, there's no literal end. Almost everything hinges on the idea of whether or not God is the creator. And this is why Adventists are staunchly defend the doctrine of creation. Accepting that our species is a product of a contingent, non-teleological process rather than a special act of creation can strike at the core of a person's self-perception, the meaningfulness of their life and their personal ethic. That's very true, isn't it? 
They realize that and they realize exactly what they're doing, striking at the core of your identity as someone being created by God. How many want to be aware of these attacks and ready to meet them as much as possible through a surrendered spirit towards the scripture and to the inspired word? Okay, so let's look at this now in the news. Are you ready for this clip? Is ready? All right, I don't, I don't think you were ready for that. It's quite ready. Let's try it again. So if I look at the United States, currently the Republican presidential candidates, as far as I know, um, every single one of the declared candidates, with the exception of Trump, about whom one doesn't know which way he would answer, when asked about evolution, essentially say they don't believe it. And Jeb Bush was asked, and he said, well, I sort of believe it, but I don't think it should be taught in schools. Oh, yeah. Well, this does fill me, but this fills me with despair. I mean, it, this is not something you believe in or not. I mean, this is a fact. It is a fact. It's just as much of a fact as that the Earth goes around the sun. Um, you can't not believe it unless you're ignorant. And um, I don't believe those presidential candidates are all ignorant. I believe what they're doing is they think that they've got to say that in order to appeal to their constituents. Okay, so what do we learn from that clip? <laughs> Evolution is pictured as a what? But there's these presidential candidates that want to do what? Win an election. So what are they saying? They believe in creation because who believes in creation? Most of the people in America. At that time, 68% of people in America believed in creation. And he's saying, no, 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 no. I've got a book I'm selling here that will help you realize that that supposed fact is not true. I'm going to change the threshold concept. Notice what Pen of Inspiration says. Satan will excite indignation against the humble minority who conscientiously refuse to accept popular customs and traditions. Men of position and reputation will join with the lawless and the vile to take counsel against the people of God. Wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with contempt. Did the statements of Doc Dawkins seem contemptuous to you? Persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them with pen, voice and pen by both threats and ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith by false representations and angry appeals. They will stir up the passions of the people. Now, how many of you think that your belief in creation will be attacked? You may not know it, but it's already attacked all over the place. But just because you don't know, it doesn't mean it's not happening, but how many think that you should maybe be aware and get ready for that? And that's the reason we're having this colloquium. Now notice as he continues, are you ready for this clip? Tell me when you're ready. Okay. Teaches medicine at Yale, and he says, he's the creationist, he thinks that um, God created the world, and he says, you're going to tell me that the complexity of the human brain, and he's a brain surgeon, came out of a soup full of chemicals and, and, and such? Well, I am going to tell him that, but not suddenly. I mean, it took a very, very long time, but by gradual stages. That's what these people don't understand. They think it all happened suddenly. Well, if you think that, of course you don't believe it, obviously. It couldn't happen suddenly. But if it happens gradually, each stage just gives rise to the next stage, the next stage, the next stage, and each stage is only a tiny bit different from the one before then you could start understanding it. Um, you just told me that all the Republican candidates except one say they don't believe in evolution. I mean, that's a disgrace. But for a senior, a very eminent, distinguished doctor, as he is, to say that, it's even worse. Because, of course, evolution is the bedrock of biology. And, bi and biology is the bedrock of medicine. And so for a distinguished doctor to not understand, I have to use the word understand, he clearly doesn't understand 
the fundamental theorem of his own subject. That is a terrible de indictment. Okay. By the way, who is he talking about? Who is Ben Carson? Okay. He, he's a Seventh-day Adventist. He's a Seventh-day Adventist physician, right? He believes in what? Creationism. And now he's being mocked and ridiculed by Richard Dawkins. Um, he clearly doesn't understand. That's a very demeaning statement, isn't it? Just like I showed you that quote. And now on the other side of it, this one, listen to this one closely. Listen to the collision. This, this guy that's interviewing Dawkins is friendly to him. You can tell that, right? He's kind of setting him up with questions so that he can sell his book and do that. But notice this one now. <laughs> I'm not recommending any networks either way, but I just think they're, they're interesting. Do you believe in God? Increasingly, fewer Americans do. According to a Pew poll, 12% of us do not have a belief in a higher power, up from 8% in 1987, and that group includes agnostics. In Europe, the rise of atheism and agnosticism is stunning. According to a Zuckerman study in Sweden, as many as 85% of the population are non-believers. Japan, 65%. France, 54 And in Britain, 44% do not believe in God in Great Britain. This now is a man who understands that position. Richard Dawkins, the author of the mega-selling best book, The God Delusion. I think it takes more faith to be like you, an atheist, than like me, a believer. And it's because of nature. You know, I just don't think we could have lucked out to have the tides come in, the tides go out, the sun go up, the sun go down. Don't think it could have happened. We have a very full understanding of why the tides go in, the tides go out, about why the continents drift about, of why life is there. Science is ever more piling on the evidence, piling on the understanding. But it had to get there. I understand that you, you know, the uh, physiology of it, if, if you will, but it had to, it had to come from somewhere, and that is the leap of faith that you guys make, that it just happened. Well, a leap of faith. You don't actually need a leap of faith. You, you're the one who needs a leap of faith because you are actually, you, the onus is on you to say why you, do, you believe in something. There's an infinite number of gods you could believe in. I take it you don't believe in Zeus or Apollo or Thor. You believe in presumably the Jesus. Christian god, Jesus. So Jesus was a real guy. I could see him. Yeah. You know, I know what he did. And so I'm not positive that Jesus is God, but I'm throwing in with Jesus rather than throwing in with you guys because you guys can't tell me how it all got here. You guys don't know. We're working on it. Physicists are working on it. Well, you get it. Maybe all well, no, I mean, if you look at the history of science over the, over the centuries, yeah. the amount that's, that's gained in knowledge each century is stupendous. In the beginning of the 21st century, we don't know everything. We have to be humble. We have to, in humility, say that there's a lot that we still don't know. And, you know, being humble is a Christian virtue. Well, there you go. All right, when you guys figure it out, then you come back here and tell me, because until that time, I'm sticking with Judeo-Christian philosophy and my religion of Roman Catholicism, because it helps me as a person. Oh, that's different. It, you know, it, helps, it helps you. Absolutely. And that I'm doesn't mean it. it's true. And, well, it's true for me. See, I, I believe... You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, something to absolutely. Prove because I can't Some things prove, either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. I can't prove to you that Jesus is God. So that truth is mine and mine alone. But you can't prove to me that Jesus is not. So you have to stay in your little You can't prove system. that Zeus is not. You can't prove that Apollo is not. Well, I God. saw Apollo, man. He's he was down there, and he's not looking good. Now, we also differ in the sense that you feel that religion has been a bane, B-A-N-E, to civilization. And I feel atheism has. And I will point to the worst mass murderers in uh, modern times, Hitler, Stalin, Mao and Pol Pot, all confirmed atheists, all people who wanted to wipe out religion. Now, I know you can point to the Crusades and you can point to Al-Qaeda right now. I mean, it's there and there's no question. But I say I'm throwing in with the founding fathers of the United States, which saw 
religion, spirituality as a moderating influence, as a good thing if people embrace the true tenets. Go ahead. Founding fathers of the United States were secularists above all. So some of them were religious, some of them were not, but they were above all secularists who believed in keeping church and state They separate. had to because of the oppression in Europe. That was what they were. That right. Precisely. But I mean, that was almost they all of them, they all said a prayer before their deliberations. In their letters, and I have almost all their letters, they all reference the deity. Our Declaration of Independence references heavily. But they saw it as a moderating influence because the federal government at that point couldn't control the country. And they said, you know, if yeah. people follow Jesus, then the country's going to be better. It may well be a moderating influence. As for Hitler and Stalin and so on, I mean, of, of course, Hitler, by the way, was a Roman Catholic. No, he never was. was. He was raised in that home. Yeah, well, he we, rejected we, it earlier. Okay. We, can, we can dispute that. Um, Stalin was an atheist, no question. Uh, but Stalin did the bad things he did, not because he was an atheist. I mean, Hitler and Stalin both had moustaches, but we don't say it was their moustaches that made them evil. I don't think they had any moral foundation, any of those guys. I will say... I don't either. Your book is fascinating. And, you know, congratulations on your success. Thanks for coming on in here. Thank you very much. Uh, guys, how, how, many can, how many of you learned a lot from that clip? How many of you learned a lot from that clip? That was threshold concepts in conflict, right? In a public forum. And uh, how many think there were some good arguments that the host came up with? I'm just telling you, these are the kind of conversations that will happen, and you need to be ready for those conversations. And uh, all around the concept of creation evolution. Now, since Ben Carson was, um, he's probably the most prominent uh, Seventh Adventist in the world. Probably more people know Ben Carson than any other Adventist. And uh, so let's listen to him just talk in a friendly forum now about creation. Are you ready? Let's hear, let's give him uh, give him a. Give him a hearing in a, in a friendly conversation. The most sophisticated organ system in the universe. Billions and billions of neurons, hundreds of billions of interconnections. It remembers every single thing you have ever seen. Every single thing you have ever heard can process more than two million bits of information in one second. I mean, it is unbelievable. Some people say, well, you, don't, you shouldn't learn this, you shouldn't learn this because you'll overload your brain. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Now, what a bunch of nonsense that is. Do you know your brain, and this is a conservative estimate, could take in one new fact every second for over three million years before you begin to challenge its capacity. So don't let anybody tell you that you can overload your brain. And that's our brains in their degenerated state. Can you imagine what they were like before? Unbelievable, because we're made in the image of God. How many people here remember your birthday? OK, I think it's unanimous. What did your brain have to do for you to respond to that question? Well, first of all, the sound waves had to leave my lips, travel through the air, enter your external auditory meatus, travel down to your tympanic membrane, set up a vibratory force, which travel across the ossicles of the middle ear to the over and round window, set up a vibratory force in the end of the lip, which mechanically distorted the microcilia, converting mechanical energy to electrical energy, which travel across the cochlear nerve to the cochlear nucleus at the pontal medullary junction, from there to the superior olivary nucleus, sitting bilaterally at the brainstem to the lateral meniscus to the inferior colliculus and the medial geniculate nuclei, across the thalamic radiations to the posterior temporal lobes, beginning auditory processing, from there to the frontal lobes, Coming down the track to Victor Jure, retrieving the memory from the immediate hippocampal structure of the memory bodies back to the frontal lobes to start the motor response at the bed cell level. Coming down the cortical spinal tract, across the internal capsule into the cerebral peduncle, descending down to the cervical medullary decussation into the spinal cord gray matter, synapsing there, going out to the neuromuscular junction, stimulating the nerve and the muscle. So you can raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and. And that's the simplified version of what your brain had to do. See if you can get one of those rap singers to do that. But you know. <laughs> 
But but if your brain can do that and you barely even had to think about it, what is your brain capable of if you actually put your mind to something? And someone wants to tell me that that came from a slime pit with a bunch of promiscuous biochemicals? Give me a break. You know, that makes, that really stretches the limits of credulity. Guys, how many of you like to see Dawkins and Carson get together? <laughs> I don't think it's ever going to happen because Dawkins now has had a stroke, but, but I think, you know, we need to be ready. Now, I want to show you one last clip about Dawkins being put under pressure. Would you like to hear this last clip? You got time? All right. This is the last clip. And I want you to see now Dawkins under pressure by uh, this guy. I think the sound should come on soon. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. How are you? Fine, thank you. Can you hear it all right? You have. Uh you have written that uh, God is a psychotic delinquent invented by mad, deluded people. No, I didn't say quite that. I said something rather better than that. Oh, well, please tell us <laughs> what you said. Please tell us what um, you said. I, well, I would have to read it from, from, from the book. No, please. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. So that's what you think of God? Yeah. How about, how about if people believed in a God of infinite lovingness and kindness and forgiveness and generosity, sort of like the modern day God? Why spoil it for them? Oh. Um, Why not just let them have their fun I, and enjoy I, it? I mean, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. I, I write a book. People can read it if, if they want to. Um, I believe that it is a liberating thing to free yourself from primitive superstition. So religion is a primitive superstition? Oh, I, th I think it is, yes. So uh, you believe it's liberating to uh, tell people that there is no God? I think a lot of people, when they give up God, feel a great sense of release uh, and freedom. Why do you think that? I mean, what's your well, dad, what's your scientist, what's your dad? I think, well, I've had a lot of, of letters saying that, and I've... There are eight billion people in the world, yeah, Dr. Yeah, Dawkins. Know, know, How yeah. many letters yeah. have you had? No, I haven't done that, 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 that's quite, quite true. Professor Dawkins seemed so convinced that God doesn't exist that I wondered if he would be willing to put a number on it. Well, it's hard to put a figure on it, but, but I, I, I mean, I'd put it as something like, you know, 99% against or something. Well, how do you know it's 99% against, don't. say, in that 97? No, I did. You asked me to put a figure on it, and I, it, I'm not comfortable putting a figure on it. I think it's, I, I just think it's very unlikely. What? But you couldn't put a number on it? No, of course not. So it, it could be, be 49%. Well, I, it would be, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's unlikely, but, but I, but, and it's, quite far from 50%. How do you know? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I put an argument in the book. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics? or in well, evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing 
possibility. Mm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. So the, the Hebrew God, the God of the Old Testament, he doesn't exist in your view? Um, Certainly, I mean, that would be a very unpleasant pro prospect. And you know. uh, the trend, holy trinity of the no, New Testament, nothing, that doesn't Nothing exist. like that. Do you believe in any of the uh, Hindu gods? Like Vishnu? How can you ask such a question? You I don't, mean, how, right? how could I? I mean, why, why in... would I, given that I don't believe in any others? You don't believe in the Muslim god? No. I mean, why do you even need to ask? Well, I just wanted to be sure. So you don't believe in any god anywhere? Any god anywhere would be completely incompatible with, 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 with anything that I've said in... in I, I assume. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to make sure you don't okay. believe in any God anywhere. No. What if, you, if after you died, you ran into God? What have you been doing, Richard? I mean, what have you been doing? I've been trying well, to be nice to you. Yeah. I gave you a multi-million dollar paycheck yeah. over and over again with your book, and look what you did. Bertrand Russell was, had that point put to him, and he said um, something like, Sir... Why did you take such pains to hide yourself? But if the intelligent design people are right, God isn't hidden. We may even be able to encounter God through science, if we have the freedom to go there. What could be more intriguing than that? By the way, <clears throat> by the way that clip Dawkins has tried to get rid of multiple times. Can you see why that might be embarrassing to him? <clears throat> so I just wanted to show you some examples of engagement with this threshold concept that can give you confidence that there are ways to get through that. Do you see why I showed you the clip? So this is what we tried to do tonight. Do you know what a threshold concept is? How many of you know what it is now? Uh, do you know some examples of threshold concepts? Um, do you know a school whose purpose changed and explain how the change came about? And you know what the purpose of Adventist education is? Have a Bible-based curriculum in all areas, not just the divinity school, right? All areas. And what is the threshold concept that Adventism staunchly defends, among others? Creation. And you know, creation evangelism, I think, is something really big. And uh, hopefully you've been taking notes. Here's what uh, someone once counseled. The very best course for you to pursue is to engage in missionary work for the people of the neighborhood and nearby settlements. Whenever you're listening to an interesting discourse, take notes and mark down the passages the minister uses so you can review the subject carefully. This is why we ask you, by the way, to take notes, not only tonight, but also in sermons, right? Then, after faithful study, you will be able to give a synopsis of the discourses in the form of a Bible reading to some who did not come to the meetings. So, uh, that's the purpose. Now, uh, just in closing, I want to call my wife up. We'll sing a little song for you. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I did alert her to this this time. <clears throat> but some years ago, we lived in a city... Wichita, Kansas, in the middle of America, and, and actually there was a, uh, <clears throat> a number of creation, um, creationists there, and they had a big, huge following, and they actually won some court cases to allow intelligent design to be taught in the various schools, and so all kinds of people from around the country came and tried to fight against that because this was a threshold thing. And we had all these big speakers, some of which we've seen tonight there. And 
<clears throat> they actually ask us to sing a song at the convention. And we've sung it here before, but I thought we'd sing it this night again. And my wife's a good sport. <clears throat> and my throat doesn't feel too good at this point for some reason, but let's try it out. Mr. Darwin, I address you to the subject of this song. I hope you're not offended when I tell you that you're wrong. But when you tell me that my ancestor's a flower or a tree, Mr. Darwin, I have to disagree. No, 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 no. You said that we were slimy once and crawled out of the sea. And though I am no scientist, I know that wasn't me. I don't know just what possessed you to say all the things you said. But when Jesus comes, your face will sure be red, 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 red. For it was God who formed me from the dust and gave my body shape. It is he that I descended from and not some hairy ape. It is he that loves and cares for me this much. I know is true and Mr. Darwin. Jesus Christ loves you. I have a little dog at home. He's got a lot to give. Ow, ow, ow. And though he is my little friend, he's not my relative. And when I go into the zoo to look at all the living things, it's just a visit. Visit. Not a family gathering. Ma, 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 ma. For it was God who formed me from the dust and gave, gave my, my body shape. shape. And it is he that I descended from, and not some hairy ape. It is he that loves and cares for me this much. I know no, it's true, and Mr. Darwin, Jesus Christ loves you. I cannot condemn you for the things, things you tried to say. All I know is you and I were never made that way. And though oh, my little furry friends so show similarities, similarities, let's not make a monkey out of me. Mr. Darwin, when the life you led in heaven's court is tried, I hope you changed the tune you sang sometime before you died. Because when Jesus comes, he's going to take his children off the ground. And you're Yo. just going to have to stick around. Bye, 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 bye. For it was God who formed me from the dust and gave, gave my body shape. It is he that I descended from and not some hairy ape. And it is he that loves and cares for me this much. Which I know is true. And Mr. Darwin, Mr. Darwin, Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus Christ loves you. So we hope to have a good weekend. Now that we understand why it's important. How many of you understand why it's important? And tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, um, we'll start with our first presentation with Dr. Sean Pittman. By the way, in his bio, uh, um, bio, he said that he was often questioned about his belief in creation and his training and his service as a, as a uh, <clears throat> pathologist, <clears throat> and hopefully I'll share some of that testimony. So 9 o'clock, then 10, 10, 15, and then 11.30. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're so thankful that we could spend a moment thinking about thinking and about threshold concepts. We're thankful that you not only created us, but also redeemed us. Give us the opportunity to be new creations in you. So bless us as we go from this place, and we thank you. We come in Christ's name. Amen. You're just